Good morning. I'm Dr. Deborah Martin, founder of Martin's Rejuvenation Center. I'm very excited today because I'm being joined by my old friend, Dr. Tim Cook. We actually went to medical school together, and he's got some very interesting information for us about the field of genomics that I'd like to share. So can you tell us a little bit about, we went to medical school together, and then you became involved in the military, in preventative health maintenance. Can you tell me a little bit more about that path for you? Thanks, Deb. Very happy to be here. You and I went to medical school at a time when the focus was on sickness care. Absolutely. And as I did my internal medicine specialty training and began to practice in that model, uh, it occurred to me that the focus really should be on health promotion disease prevention. Mm. And uh, really for the last 20 years or so of my uh, career, I've been uh, tailoring my practice for patients to achieve uh, longevity and well-being through health promotion and disease prevention. I did a master's degree in this subject uh, in 2006 and so for the last decade at least I, it's really been my entire focus. Hmm. When we were in medical school we learned about very classic genetics. Uh, you may have heard of Mendel mm -hmm. and his peas. Basically at that time we didn't know really very much about what differentiates humans one from another and the variability that accounts for that in the, in the genetic uh, makeup. Uh, the reality is that we're almost identical to our primate cousin, chimpanzees. Right, what's the percentage? The, 98.5% of our chromosomes are exactly the same as a chimpanzee. Very close. Right. And so uh, amongst humans, the difference between us is maybe 99.5% uh, or 0.5% difference. Amazing. And uh, it took roughly 13 years for the first human genome project to actually sequence all six billion letters or three billion base pairs of our uh, genome. And what does that mean exactly to sequence the genome? So as we've had next generation technologies to be able to identify what the letters of our genome are, mm -hmm. we can now actually lay out the blueprint that represents each and every one of us individually. The analogy that I like to draw is to uh, an Encyclopedia Britannica, for example. Mm -hmm. If you consider that each of us carries 23 volumes of Encyclopedia mm -hmm. in pairs, one from your mother, one from your father. Mm -hmm. Inside a encyclopedia, when you open it up, what do you see? Letters that make words, that make sentences, that make paragraphs and chapters. Mm -hmm. And the human genome is actually structured in a very similar way. The letters, of course, exist as only four, T, C, A, and G. But remarkably, that defines uh, all of the various proteins, several hundred thousand types of proteins that come from 22,000 different genes that make up humans and make up the difference between us and not just chimpanzees, but uh, rabbits and bananas. Uh, bananas, by the way, have four chromosomes. As mentioned, we have 23. And one of them are, is the sex chromosome that makes uh, men or women. But the 22 autosomal chromosomes have all of these genes splayed through them. Mm -hmm. The concept of personalized medicine Mm -hmm. is understanding what the variations are in your genome that make you different in terms of your response to medications. That's called pharmacogenomics. Okay. In terms of your response to diet and exercise, mm. that's nutrigenomics. <clears throat> and hmm. uh, uh, also, of course, what your disease risks, what your inheritance is, what your family history is, will all influence and all allow us to uh, understand and, and interact with your environment. So give me a practical example of that. Let's say I have a heart attack. Um, is there some kind of change difference in medications that might be used? First of all, it's important to know what your family history is. If you have heart attacks in the family at, at, at young ages, prematurely in their 40s, for example, in your parents mm -hmm. uh, or in your siblings, <clears throat> that has a, uh, a strong suspicion for a genetic load or some specific predisposition from your genome. Mm -hmm. Obviously, things that you uh, do in your life, your environment, uh, exposures, your behaviors, whether you 
eat well or badly, whether you exercise or not, and certainly if you smoke, for example, these are all risk factors for developing a heart attack. But we can look in the genome uh, now in uh, quite easy ways mm. and identify specific risk factors for developing heart attack, for example. Okay, this is actually a really great example because my mother did have a heart attack. She was 78 years old, and so I thought, and my risk factors are fairly low, but I had my genomics done with this test we're gonna talk about called 23andMe, mm -hmm. and it said that in fact, for my age, um, that my genetic risk is a little higher than I would have thought so. Mm -hmm which was interesting information because it means that I have to watch what I do now in order to lessen my risk of heart disease, and make sure I'm exercising and continue exactly. to not smoke and all those things. What I hear from people who are not fully educated uh, about uh, these new genomic tests is why would I want to test a gene mm. if I can't change it? Mm -hmm. And it's true, we do not have gene therapy that we could change or alter the way your genes uh, exist as a structure, but we do have the capacity to change whether a gene is functioning or turned on or whether it's turned off. Really? That we only knew as well in the last 15 years when we discovered what's now been termed epigenetics. This is the fact that everything you do in your environment in real time influences and interacts with your own genome. And so in particular, from a preventive health perspective, the lifestyles that we choose to lead have very strong influence on whether certain of your 22,000 genes are active or not. If there's bad ones there and you can turn them off, you can improve your uh, future health. Wow, okay, I didn't know that. I didn't know that you can turn them off. Can you give me an example of something along that line? Sure. We have uh, some very, uh, broad evidence now that things like meditation will downregulate the genes involved in your stress response. We're all familiar with our hot buttons that get us revved up, get us anxious, mm. things that uh, initiate that fight or flight response. Uh, fight, fight, flight or freeze it's actually called. Mm. And uh, there are roughly 500 genes that are involved in mediating that response. Mm. When you do have an, uh, an anxious stress response, your blood pressure goes up, your heart rate goes up, but more importantly, your sympathetic system with the adrenaline and your cortisol, your stress hormones get turned on. Mm. Now, if you undertake practice of relaxing, which actually is a very specific relaxation response that turns off those genes, mm. they've actually shown that uh, within the genome, there are changes in the structure of the DNA on your chromosomes that carry those particular genes that turn them off hmm. and turn them off for uh, potentially long term. In fact, epigenetics speaks to the fact that our children inherit the propensity to turn on or off genes like stress or famine. If you've been through a famine in your lifetime, the uh, potato famine, for example, they've shown that the children of those uh, families that lived through the potato famine actually had genes turned on for storage of uh, energy mm. more efficiently <laughs> so that they could survive on the assumption there's ongoing famine. So by knowing something about our own genome, we can actually not influence our own outcome, but that of our children potentially? Absolutely. Wow. That okay, is the that's power of found. epigenetics. It's remarkable. We didn't know it existed until, uh, as I say, 10 to 15 years ago. Yeah, I don't remember anything about that from medical school. We had genetics and <laughs> no. now this whole genomics thing is brand new. Brand Gen new. Genomics, the, the, the contrast to classical genetics is that it's really the study of the entire structure, uh, not just of the DNA, which is uh, obviously these four letters, but the proteins that are 50% uh, of a chromosome is made up of proteins. And those proteins for a long time were kind of ignored and chucked away, mm. especially when Watson and Crick first came forward in 1953 with the, the DNA structure and said, this is the meaning of life. Mm -hmm. Everything falls from DNA. But mm -hmm. that determinism uh, is actually not real. The proteins that are around the chromosome are critically mm. important for turning on and off those genes. Mm. 
the expression of those genes. I see. And so um, understanding how those things work uh, and how they interact both uh, between us and our environment is uh, what genomics is all about. Uh, there's a new aspect as well to this that I'd like to speak about regarding uh, biological age versus chronological age. One of my favorite topics. <clears throat> We all are interested in aging, whether you're 20 years old or uh, 80. Uh, I think right now, because of the advent of uh, genomics and of the research that backs up our understanding of why we age, mm -hmm. uh, this um, specialty of age management mm -hmm. is, uh, is really ready for prime time. Absolutely. Uh, the baby boomer generation, uh, you know, have heard that the 60 is the new 50. Uh, and I think the potential to not just uh, extend our lifespan, but advance our health span. Mm. Health span is the concept that you feel and look and behave as healthy as you were at age 30, right through until your death at 85, 90, or 105. Right. Uh, that's so-called squaring the curve. So instead of like slowly declining in age and getting old and decrepit, we go like crazy until we're 90, year, until we're 90 years old and like drop dead. Bingo. Right. That's what I want to do. And that it should be, anyway, everybody's uh, ideal target. Very few people want to say, yeah, I'd like to spend the last 15 years of my life in pain, in hospital, um, using healthcare dollars. Uh, but that's the reality of, of uh, the majority of our population. So what can we do now to change that outcome? Uh, one is understand what's in your genome and what the risks are mm -hmm. and begin to make behavioral changes that are sustainable to alter those risks potentially. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I should just say that there are some genetic diseases, gene-based diseases, that we do not have a response to. And like Huntington's Korea. Huntington's Korea, a classic example. Horrible disease. Right. Very few um, uh, folks want to know, mm. uh, uh, unless it's, it's in the family and you want to know if you've inherited and you're going to pass it to your children. It's a disease that onsets suddenly with de neurodegeneration in your 50s. Unfortunately, medical science has not conquered that. Not yet. We do not test for that in the panels of lifestyle genomics that uh, that mm. we, we are offering currently, that's not one of the standard tests. But you can test for it if somebody were to ask for it, is that right? Yes, and many of these kind of disease-related uh, genetic risks are covered by our uh, national and provincial health services. Uh, uh, another classic example is breast cancer right. that's familial, or hereditary breast cancer, and we've all recently heard of a famous actress who uh, is carrying um, mm breast cancer genes one and two that increase her risk so dramatically that she elected to have mastectomies, mm -hmm. which I think is um, a very valid response to understanding a risk that increases uh, the probability of acquiring a cancer by 85 or 90 percent. What's important to know is, first of all, that particular gene test, the BRCA ones and twos, <coughs> is available through OHIP mm -hmm. uh, here in Ontario. Mm -hmm. um, it's not available through private systems at all, actually, because it's a test that's been patented in the United States. Hmm. Um, but only about 10 to 15 percent of breast cancers in general are hereditary, hmm. and only about half of those are related to BRCA carriage. There are other genes that increase, to a lesser or greater degree, your risk of acquiring breast cancer as either a, a woman or a man. Hmm. And those genes we do check in the test that we have uh, on offer. And can we do something to, to try and downregulate those genes? Absolutely. Like what? Give me an example. If you think about, well, if 15% of breast cancers are genetic, what are the other 85%? We know that there are risk factors of our lifestyle and potentially of uh, medications and exposures that we have <coughs> that increase that risk. Uh -huh. And so, for example, um, being uh, seriously overweight increases the risk. Um, alcohol in excess in, in women increases the risk. Mm -hmm. So there are lifestyle factors that are... Uh, stress. And stress. That's <clears throat> bad for all cancers. Generally, yes. 
Can I ask you something? You mentioned briefly when we first started talking about weight control yeah. and genetics. Mm -hmm. Could you go into that? Sure. Tell me about that. So the um, nutrigenomics testing is uh, now also come of age. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, you may not recognize the fact that everything we put in our mouths that's food is foreign to us. Um, these are proteins and uh, fats and carbohydrates that we don't necessarily have in our body already. Mm -hmm. About 50% of our immune cells are lining the intestine. They're to respond to uh, macronutrients or worse, if you consume bacteria or viruses as part of your food by accident, uh, and in certain parts of the world it's commonplace, mm -hmm. then the immune system is there to respond to that as well. It turns out that certain mutations, which are also called polymorphisms or variants of our, our genome, will predispose to an inflammatory response to certain foodstuffs, one more than another. So and, again, give me an example of that. Right. <clears throat> Tell me what you mean. Some people have uh, a change in their gene that means they respond dramatically with inflammation in their intestine and then in their body in relation to carbohydrates only. Or they respond that same way dramatically with inflammation to fats. Okay, so if they get inflammation, what does that mean? Inflammation in general is uh, a response by our immune system that leads to higher levels of uh, cortisone, higher levels of other hormones and uh, proteins that are responding to attack something. And potentially uh, autoimmune disease comes from this as well. So celiac, you may have heard of, is an autoimmune attack on our intestines as a result of a response to gluten protein, which is in wheat and other um, grains. And so uh, we now have the ability to identify in the genome of individuals this propensity to have inflammation with a specific macronutrient uh, intake. So do you test for the specific macronutrient, like fat or a carbohydrate? We're testing for the variant that leads to an inflammatory response to those things and can therefore give guidance to people based, uh, tailored on their own individual genome, uh -huh. whether they should be avoiding carbs or fats or just having a balanced diet. Hmm. What's interesting to me is that I've uh, interpreted, helped to interpret over 200 of these tests in the last uh, three years. And when we do the testing on people that are in their 60s mm -hmm. who have spent, unfortunately in many cases, a lifetime of trial and error of dozens of diets, mm -hmm. many of them have come to the conclusion that they should really avoid X carbs or fats or some food stuff in their diet in order to help them lose weight. Mm -hmm. And when we do the test, we often find that the genetics mm. are in uh, accordance with what they've discovered. But, but if it's you're, taken them 40 years to figure it exactly. out. Exactly. If you're a younger person with a concern about weight, wouldn't it be worthwhile to understand what your genome is telling you how you should eat? Mm. <clears throat> Now, that's the uh, nutrition side. On the exercise and activity side, mm -hmm. the same test, which by the way is done in a simple swab of the inside of your cheek, mm -hmm. that same test will give guidance regarding the intensity of exercise required to, to uh, uh, aid in weight loss. Hmm. For the same kinds of reasons, every time we exercise, there is an inflammatory response in the body. Mm -hmm. Typically, if you're exercising, especially very intensely, um, your muscles and your joints are taking a beating. And there may be an inflammatory response to that. Often yeah. folks will ache when they exercise and they're taking anti-inflammatories to try to, to reduce the symptom. Mm -hmm. This genomics test will actually identify variations that lead to a brisker inflammatory response with intense exercise than with moderate or vice versa and give guidance to people who are uh, perhaps not exercising the right way for their genome. Okay, you're going to have to give me an example of that one. 
You and I have both seen many people who say, you know, I exercise like crazy doctor and I can't lose weight. In fact, it seems like I gain weight. Yes. And uh, frankly, 10 years ago, I would have said, well, that makes no sense. Um, and now I have a pretty, under, pretty good understanding that a percentage of our population carries a variant in their um, adrenergic receptor a beta protein that uh, actually leads them to have an inflammatory response that's way out of proportion when they exercise too intensely. And uh, not only will they be symptomatic with pain often, but they, they may in, ha in fact increase their adrenaline and cortisol levels to the extent that they gain weight because cortisol, as you know, is a growth factor. It puts weight on people. Mm. If we start folks on prednisone as a an, uh, powerful anti-inflammatory drug, they almost inevitably gain weight. Mm. Prednisone is cortisone. And, and so, which is why your typical sort of overweight 50-year-old man who with a high-stress job is more likely to be kind of portly. Indeed. Um, we have an epidemic of obesity and all of its consequences, diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, heart attacks, strokes, Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. These are sleep apnea. These are all connected to our obesity epidemic. And this is multifactorial, our weight problem in, in North America. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but one of the reasons is uh, stress, increasing cortisol and uh, increasing weight. The other big reason I think is, is uh, our, our nutrition is very different now than it was when we were hunter-gatherers. For many hundred thousands of years, we did not consume refined grains. We did not consume um, much in the way of uh, dairy products. Mm -hmm. And uh, our reliance now on sort of quick foods, high, uh, frankly, toxic carbohydrate compounds, uh, high fructose corn syrup, for example, is in about 80% of our foodstuffs. Uh, this is all contributing to our, our weight gain. Mm -hmm. And in those folks who carry this mutation that leads to re uh, inflammatory response to carbohydrate, being on uh, a lot of uh, carbs is uh, anathema. It's, it's, it's the opposite of what they should be doing. Mm. And you can tell that by doing a genetic testing. Absolutely. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So back to my I have a heart attack example. Yes. I, I, I think in my testing it said something about the use of that uh, Coumadin. So right. in my genetic testing that I did with 23andMe, it said that if I were to take this particular drug, that it would be, um, m it would have more effect in me than it would in other people, and therefore my dose should be lower. Yeah. Are there many drugs that are available to us in genetic testing now that can give us that kind of information? Yeah, the pharmacogenomic field is exploding right now. There's a huge mm. amount of research in this area, Deb. Um, 21 different drug responses are available through 23andMe. The ones that are of most relevance, especially in the heart world and the vascular disease world, are not just blood thinner, the warfarin as you described, but also uh, the statin group of drugs, which are cholesterol lowering. Mm. Uh, Lipitor, Crestor, these are the two blockbuster drugs, the largest selling drugs in the world. Mm. Well, if you think about it, and you and I have both studied randomized controlled trials, double blind, placebo controlled, etc., the outcome of those trials are typically three for patients. Mm -hmm. One group of patients responds magically to medication and they have a dramatically beneficial response with very few side effects. Mm -hmm. Another group will have some response but moderate or barely and they may have side effects. And then there's a group who have potentially negative response. It's actually worse for them mm -hmm. and or they have nothing but side effects and no benefit. And that breaks out to about a third, a third and a third. In order for a drug to get on the market, all they have to do is say, on average in a population, mm. it's a little more beneficial than uh, causing adverse effects. And in the, in the setting of these statin drugs, we know that uh, many people will have uh, successful cholesterol lowering, but also 10 or 15% won't tolerate the, the medication because of uh, muscle pain mm. and also liver enzyme abnormalities. Mm. The question is, who is going to have that? Where do you fall? Which group are you in? 
And uh, we actually now have the ability with these tests to tell you specifically you are a adverse effect responder versus a uh, no adverse effect responder. So potentially, not only am I not going to spend the money on a drug that won't work, but I'm not going to buy a drug that's going to hurt my liver, for instance. Exactly. Mm. And I think ultimately there's some significant cost benefit analysis that will come to our healthcare systems when we are implementing these kinds of pharmacogenomics practices on a regular basis because, as you say, it's costly to be uh, administering drugs to people when you might know uh, beforehand mm -hmm. that they're not going to work and only cause adverse effects. Yeah. And uh, one of the particular areas of interest is in the field of chemotherapies for cancer. And mm. it's very clear now that women, for example, who have breast cancer who get standard chemotherapy have the same third, third, third. And uh, those that are not responding to the chemotherapy well, or in fact, not at all, mm -hmm. frequently carry a particular um, genetic uh, polymorphism, a, a mutation that leads to the non-response. And uh, that knowledge is uh, critically important because if, if you're not going to respond to this chemotherapeutic regimen, you need to pick a different one. That's huge. Unfortunately, in uh, North America, in the United States, many insurance companies mm -hmm. will not offer those chemotherapies unless you've done the genetic testing really? first. That is not the case in Canada. Unfortunately, in Canada, typically uh, the, res the response from our, our cancer specialists is, well, try the drugs. Let's try it. If it doesn't work, we'll move to something else. Mm -hmm. And they don't do the genetic testing. But this genetic testing is available to us privately. We could potentially test for that. Yes. Hmm. This is a much more recent development. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a type of testing called copy number variations. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not widely available yet, but will be, I think, in the near future. Okay. What if you're about, if you're young, you're 20 years old and planning a family? Yes. Where would the genetic testing come in there? That's a very good question. <clears throat> Hopefully at age 20 you are healthy. You may though have a family history of certain conditions and you'd like to know if you've inherited those conditions mm -hmm. and or if you are likely to be passing those conditions on to your children, assuming mm -hmm. you're wishing a family. And so uh, understanding the traits that you carry that may not be affecting you and may never affect you, but have the potential to affect your children if uh, your spouse or the, um, the parent, other parent of that child also carries that trait. And often these traits are recessive. If you get two, mm. uh, you're going to have a problem. Mm. The most classic example of this is the most common disease in uh, Caucasian populations is something called hemochromatosis, which is iron overload. Mm -hmm. There are two common mutations that contribute to development of hemochromatosis. The, uh, uh, the fact is about 1 in 20 people carry those mutations. Mm -hmm. If you have two of them, you're at risk of uh, overloading with iron and it's a very simple undertaking to prevent that. Mm -hmm. If you don't prevent that and you don't know about it and you have 20 or 30 years of iron overload, uh, there are some very serious life-threatening consequences that come from that and unfortunately we have many patients that, with hemochromatosis who are dying from diabetes, heart disease, liver disease, and cirrhosis and other problems. Iron is supposed to be in your bone marrow but it's not supposed to be in all these other organs. Mm. And so um, understanding that you might be carrying one of these iron load mutations is an important fact. Hmm. Or, for instance, cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is another classic one. Same thing. You can carry the gene and it's not a problem, but the minute you take a man and woman, put them together, and now that child has cystic fibrosis or could potentially have it. Exactly. Right. Okay. Can I ask you, how do we go about getting this testing done? What are the different levels of testing that could potentially? So, so far, all I've done is 23andMe. It's uh, genetic testing that does some very simple um, like background in terms of heart disease and high blood pressure and so on, tells me a little bit about some medications, tells me a little bit about predisposition to illnesses, mm -hmm. um, but it's a pretty introductory genetic testing is my understanding. 
And now you're talking about the nutrigenetics and the right. everything else. So the um, 23andMe actually has developed over the course of the last seven years uh, a, a very extensive actual uh, assessment of what are called SNPs. SNP stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. If we go back to our encyclopedia analogy, mm -hmm. this is letter changes alone that uh, may change the meaning of a word or a sentence in your, uh, in your encyclopedia. Hmm. So instead of being a T, it turns to be a C. And the result of that may mean uh, that the protein that's being made by that gene is a little bit different. Hmm. Um, and so we are now aware of several million SNPs in the human population. Mm -hmm. This accounts for roughly 25% of the variability between humans. Hmm. And they do a very large screen for SNPs, which ultimately looks for roughly 250 different diseases and traits um, and pharmacogenomic responses to drugs, etc. So I think uh, the 23andMe is a, uh, a very good start, start point for genomic analysis. Mm -hmm. Um, but as I mentioned, SNPs are not the only uh, tool that we have in our genomic toolbox. Mm -hmm. um, the other company that I am uh, using is uh, Interleukin Genetics, which is the one that provides uh, actually four different analyses on a, a single specimen, uh, the uh, buccal swab specimen. Mm -hmm. And these are the uh, weight management. So looking for mutations that, that uh, can guide how we eat and how we exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, looking for um, nutritional needs. And so <clears throat> if you have mutations in your vitamin B metabolism pathway, you may need to be taking more vitamin B uh, or mm. different types of vitamin B in order mm. to actually have the uh, most healthy machinery. Your vitamin B complexes are very, very important in the... Uh, enzymes of your body. Also, uh, that nutritional needs panel looks for mutations in your antioxidant capacity. Hmm. Uh, five different genes or five different proteins that are uh, effective for antioxidation um, may or may not be uh, optimally functioning hmm. w if you have some of these mutations. Again, what's the outcome of that if you are uh, having multiple suboptimal uh, antioxidant capacity because of these mutations, then you need to be taking supplements that assist you with antioxidation mm -hmm. and you need to be following a lifestyle and a diet that capitalizes on anti-inflammation and antioxidation. These are the two most important causes of aging in the first place, inflammation, oxidation, and what we call advanced glycemic end products or um, sticking sugar molecules on your proteins that's not good for us either. That's why diabetics get into such a big problem. So nutritional needs, I think, is a very, very useful test because uh, the outcome is lifestyle and supplement use, which everybody can partake of. So what's really occurring to me here is that me as a physician, I'm able to follow everything that you're saying here, but even I'm stretching a little when you start talking about all these potential things that could be tested for and what you have to do for them. And I think what I'm really looking forward to is the fact that you're really good at this and you have a lot of experience with it and you're on the cutting edge of it. And so it means that if we get our testing done, you're able to interpret it for us. Because it's one thing to get the test done and get like a, well, yes, no, or maybe, but what does that really mean? And how do I take that information and incorporate it into my own life yes. in order to optimize my health for the next 30, 40, 50 years? That's what I want to know. What do I do? And what I'm hearing is that the good news here is that given that it's based on my genetics, that's not going to change a whole lot. I'll meditate and do the things that I need to do to, to optimize it. But once I get these tests done, that's who I am. Mm -hmm. So I have that information now to use for the rest of my life. Exactly. The younger I am when I get this information, the better it is to help me. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I think your point is very well taken. Some of these tests, 23andMe, for example, have come to market as a direct-to-consumer in the United States that's permitted. It 
officially isn't in Canada. Mm. Um, and by that, you could order the test yourself. The problem with that is the report is very uh, detailed. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take into account, they don't ask you what your personal history is no. or your concerns. They don't, they don't ask you what your family history is no. <laughs> and what your lifestyle is. Right. And so having a, uh, a clinician at the interface between the results of these genetic tests right. and what it means to you as an individual, we are all unique and our genome is unique and how we should respond to it needs yeah. to be tailored or personalized. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, so I'm now um, hmm. the director of a clinic, a new clinic called P3. Mm -hmm. In Toronto. In Toronto. Mm -hmm. P3 stands for Personalized, Participatory and Preventive. Mm. There are a bunch of other P's I could have put in there, but um, that would be a mouthful. The personalized piece is genomics. It's also having a physician that spends the time with you and cares about you and brings care back to healthcare, I think. And unfortunately, our healthcare system in general is uh, very stretched uh, for time. Well, and it's so reactionary. You know, I, as you know, I spent 25 years in the emergency department. And the reality is that you sit there and wait for bad things to happen. And I've gotten kind of tired of that. I want to be more proactive. I want to intervene when I can make a difference right. instead of picking up the pieces when the bad things happen. Yes. Uh, similarly, I spent uh, 20 years looking after extremely sick people in hospital wards of our uh, tertiary academic hospitals and mm -hmm. intensive care units. Mm -hmm. And what disturbed me as I was doing that was how many folks were suffering from conditions that were preventable had they made changes or had changes uh, occurred to their environment or to their experiences 20 or 30 years earlier, mm -hmm. which really is what motivated me to uh, focus my attentions more recently on preventive care. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the P for participatory, Deb, mm -hmm. relates to the fact that uh, it's all well and good to be told, uh, here's a list of foods you should eat or should not eat. Um, it's all very well to be told you should exercise like this or like that, mm -hmm. but we all know it's difficult to ingrain or entrain those behavior changes mm. without being guided or facilitated. And of course, fitness trainers have capitalized on that business quite well. Mm -hmm. um, it's a bit easier, albeit still difficult, to begin to be exercise on a regular basis when you have somebody who's there uh, uh, leading you, mm -hmm. uh, motivating you at the same time. Mm -hmm. What's increasingly evident is that notwithstanding uh, dietitians and nutritionists, they're not typically in your house or uh, giving you cooking lessons. So I think a teaching kitchen is something that I'm quite passionate about bringing uh, to people because you, you then have the ability to actually see how easy it can be to, mm. to purchase, to prepare, and, and, uh, and to enjoy healthy foods that are personalized to your genomics. Mm. And then finally, uh, mm. a moment about mind-body connection because the science around this I've, uh, I've been following for close to 10 years as well. Mm -hmm. And inducing a relaxation response every day for as much as you can, even a minimum of 10 minutes, mm -hmm. is critically important for our health and probably as important or more so than exercise and nutrition. But the three of them together are a, a, a kind of a triumvirate of good health span. And so a relaxation response and the uh, so-called contemplative practices that lead to that are things like meditation, and you can do that many different ways. Um, yoga, that includes a meditative component. Mm -hmm. Tai Chi, mm -hmm. prayer if you're religious but you don't have to be. <clears throat> uh, there are biofeedback tools that I frequently offer to my patients who think all the rest of those things are not possible or are too difficult. Right. Uh, There's a little tool, isn't there, that yes. gives you a, a sense of your relaxation level? Exactly. Tell me about that guy. So that's called HeartMath. Yeah. A company in California, 
HeartMath has been uh, researching this. It's very science-based. It's uh, so-called heart rate variability analysis. Mm -hmm. And this is a very good reflection of whether your stress system is turned on or your relaxation system is turned on. Mm -hmm. And we don't practice this. No, no one It's <laughs> brain training. It's the same kind of training as your physical fitness trainer is doing is a, a facilitator of, of these brain training. And essentially, um, it's not just a matter of pretending you're at a beach. It's actually uh, focusing your attention in a very particular way, observing without judgment, mm -hmm. and allowing yourself to accept and let go of, of the stresses that we all have. You can't get rid of the stress, but you can change the way you react to it, and you can change your physical response Beautiful. to it. It's, I find it funny because here we are, we went to medical school together and then we went off on our own paths and both had three children and were married and so on and, and then you had your internal medicine career and you're flying all around the world and I was in the emergency department and we're, and then at the, around the same time we both, di we both discovered like the whole meditation thing and then we both became interested in rejuvenation and longevity and so on and here we are a few years later. A few. On the very much the same path. I think many people are coming to the same kinds of conclusions that the, the lives we've lived and the stressors in our modern society, the theory of multitasking, that you can have multiple technologic gadgets going simultaneously and that your brain can actually uh, engage in those activities all at the same time mm -hmm. uh, is not only ludicrous, it's, it's harmful. Our, uh, our lifestyles are killing us. And until hmm. recently, getting back to the heart disease, if you'd asked a cardiologist five or ten years ago, uh, you know, is stress a risk factor doctor for me having a heart attack, they would shrug their shoulders because it wasn't very quantifiable. It was a little too um, touchy-feely for many cardiologists. So they had a sense that maybe it did, but they couldn't tell you how much or, more importantly, how to change it. Exactly. Yeah. And now we have some very large studies that have actually identified stress and the way they analyze that is if you have a sense of inability to control yourself, your environment, your work, if, you, if you're not in control, your stress levels at baseline are very high mm -hmm. and this absolutely increases your risk of developing some very bad outcomes, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, cancer. cancer they're all connected mm -hmm. and preventable because uh, getting control, again, not necessarily of, your, uh, of, of the environment, but of yourself and your response to it is absolutely within your power mm -hmm. with some appropriate guidance by trained but people. It doesn't mean that we all have to go and sit on a mountaintop all day. No. You can still be a busy functioning executive, but have that sense of control and ease yeah. even though you're dealing with this 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 in right. fact personally i can i find that i can handle much more if i've got that sense of equanimity control. equanimity great word can i ask you one more thing i want to know about telomeres tell me about that yes so in the age management business telomeres have been a revolution um a researcher by the name of Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn and her team received the Nobel Prize for discovering this in mm. 2009 um, after a couple of decades of research. Telomeres can be conceived of like the, uh, the little endings of your shoelaces mm. that bind your shoelace so it doesn't come apart and ravel. Huh, good analogy. I like that one. <laughs> and in the um, uh, cellular business of reproduction, in order for us to con continue our lives, our cells need to keep reproducing and regenerating. And so for a single cell to become two cells, um, the DNA needs to kind of unzip and replicate. Yes. Now, as your chromosome, which contains the DNA, is going about this business, the telomeres are um, what we call nonsense DNA. So it's a bunch of repeat letters at the end of each chromosome, like caps, that prevent the chromosome tails from connecting and interacting and getting tangled up. Hmm. Now, every time a cell divides, those telomeres shorten a little bit. 
Mm -hmm. They get, if you will, wasted. If you're unzipping your jacket, for example, near the bottom, you would like there to be something holding it together uh, and, and take the heat if there's, uh, if there's damage. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the telomeres get a bit shorter and are a strong reflection of the age of your cells, how many reproduction cycles they've been through. Uh, there is an enzyme called telomerase, which is designed to help build back up the telomere, but it never quite keeps up. And so over the course of these decades of research, Dr. Blackburn has put together a very large normative database, meaning a bell curve of average telomere lengths in the peripheral white blood cells, uh, your lymphocytes, for example, in your, uh, in your white blood cells, the type of white blood cells that fight infection. Mm -hmm is what they've mainly studied, and the average length of a, an individual's telomeres is reflective of their biological age. So if you're a 52-year-old man, your telomere, on average, should be X number of uh, letters long. Mm -hmm. If your telomeres, as a 52-year-old man, are much, much shorter, i.e. they're the same length as the average 80-year-old, you have a problem. Mm, yeah. If they are much longer than average, then you seem to be uh, doing well. Your biological age is less than your chronological age. Now, this is in large populations. In individuals, it requires a little bit more um, interpretation. Mm. But in general, if you are a significant outlier from the average length of telomere, then uh, there are some potential, in, uh, uh, there's advice that can come from that that will potentially, especially if your telomeres are short, allow them to lengthen. So th this is the only hmm. genetic test that we do repeatedly. Every one to two years, we hmm. recommend a telomere length. Dr. Blackburn is absolutely convinced that within the next decade, when you go to your family doctor, you'll get cholesterol, because we all know hmm. that that's been important for developing heart disease. Mm -hmm. But you'll also get a telomere length, because it hmm. turns out in her research that short telomeres are highly correlated with premature death, heart disease, cancers. Uh, they're associated with having depression, having high stress levels, having exposures to toxins like chemotherapies. And so um, understanding what our cells are telling us about our biological age hmm. can very much help us, uh, empower us to make lifestyle changes as well. Hmm, interesting. So if I find out that my telomeres are short, there are things that I can do specific to my genome that will allow me to lengthen my telomeres? Yes. And there's been a <laughs> number of large trials replicating that very fact. We can lengthen our telomeres by activating telomerase through lifestyle and sometimes through supplements. If, for example, we find that you're uh, prone to inflammation, you're prone to uh, not handling oxidation or oxidants very well, some of the supplements and diets that are anti-inflammatory and antioxidant will be beneficial and lengthen telomeres. But back to our mind, body and meditation story, mm. it's very clear that meditation and regular relaxation response uh, programs will lengthen our telomeres as well. Hmm. Wow. This is really mind-boggling, and it's something that's just developing now. Like over the course, maybe 10 years ago it started, five years ago it started to pick up steam, and now we're really into it, right? I think that uh, it's very progressive to have telomere testing, but the test has been available for at least half a dozen years mm. to the public, mm. uh, but it's not at public expense. Right. I have no idea when our public health system might embrace it. Mm. Um, again, if we look at the cholesterol testing model, when the cholesterol test first became commonplace was in the early 1980s when we were in medical school. And there were no drugs at that point to treat cholesterol. We, yeah. were, we were advocating for lifestyle changes. Then we began to have those so-called statin drugs that were very potent lowers of cholesterol. Yeah. And they showed when you took them, if, especially if you had had a heart attack or a stroke already, mm -hmm. they significantly reduced your risk of having another one. Mm -hmm. And so testing for cholesterol and 
treating it became, uh, frankly, one of the more common reasons that uh, folks were visiting their physician. Mm. Um, I do believe that telomere length modulation with mm -hmm. both lifestyle and potentially supplements, potentially medications in the future will, uh, will be uh, the standard of care by the end of our medical practices. <laughs> which, <hopefully laughs> which would be 50 or 60 years from now. That's what I'm decades. thinking. <laughs> Perfect. You know, I could probably talk to you and I have talked to you for hours about this and I'm hoping that we can talk about this again because this is fascinating and I think that people need to know what's happening so that they can alter the outcome for themselves. Absolutely. Me included. Thank you for coming. You're very welcome, Deb. Okay, so we've got lots of information from Dr. Cook. What we need to talk about now is what specific tests are available and how we can package them together and how the interpretation works. So can you give me a feel for that? Yes. Hmm. Basically, I have three different companies uh, providing uh, a panel of tests. Mm -hmm. uh, the one you mentioned, 23andMe, is a uh, multiple SNP or single nucleotide polymorphism analysis. So uh, a couple hundred different diseases they look for, traits, mm -hmm. and the pharmacogenomics uh, how you respond to drugs. That's all part of that one picture. Fairly basic introductory group that, that of is, testing. Yeah, uh, gives a lot of information now for, uh, you know, it's quite, quite good value, I believe. Mm. Um, that may be the start point for most people. Mm -hmm. It does cover the most common um, genetic-based uh, disease risks that we are aware of in our population. Such as? Uh, such as, as I mentioned, the iron overload, the hemochromatosis iron. disease. It looks for a uh, uh, apolipoprotein E, which is a particular risk factor for, depending on, on your particular variant of it, risk factor for Alzheimer's. Yeah. Uh, also risk factor, or APOE predicts how you respond to uh, statin drugs like Crestor and Lipitor again. And so just to be clear, this test doesn't tell you if you have the disease or not. It's not going to tell you, yes, you're going to get Alzheimer's disease. What it tells you is, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, what it tells you is that your, the general population risk is here mm -hmm. and your risk is either a little higher or a little lower than the general population. Is that right? Yes, in the case of APOE predicting Alzheimer's, it's not just a little. If you carry, mm. now it's quite uncommon, thankfully, but if you carry two of these so-called APOE4s, mm -hmm. uh, usually there's a family history of Alzheimer's in, mm -hmm. a, in a young population. If you carry both, you have a roughly 80% uh, potential for that. Having said that, uh, that risk will be altered by lifestyle. And so mm. if you go to an Alzheimer's clinic and measure the APOEs, there's a disproportionate number of folk there with APOE4. But not everybody who has E4s gets it, and not everybody who's got others escapes it. Okay, so it does come down to getting this test done and knowing that you might be at a higher risk than other people so that you can then potentially change your... Um, Lifestyle. Lifestyle. Yes. Thank you for that word. Yes. So yeah, you can change things in order to change that outcome. So for instance, for me, the test was reasonably boring, which is good. We boring want boring. Yeah. We want boring. We don't want to come up with any really high, you know, you're likely to get this disease or that disease. What mine ended up being was a, a list of like 30 diseases that I probably won't get, but I still could. And for instance, the cardiovascular one came up as here is your here's the average population risk and your risk as a result of your genetic testing is a little higher. Yeah. And it also told me that my, this response to the Coumadin drug is going to be a little different. So there was a few little things in my testing and really the, it, ultimately it ended up being, you know, you're pretty much okay. <laughs> um, and that's what you hope for. Yeah. And then every so often you run into something that you can really specifically say, look, there's a, there's a red flag here. You need to change some things in order to alter that. Yeah. So this is the introductory package that we would yeah. be looking at is the SNP testing. Correct. Right? Now, okay. you get a report from that. Mm -hmm. That report is specifically regarding the variants that they found on your test. Mm -hmm. And this test, by the way, is done by saliva. It's, uh, it's right. very easy and fast. Yes. Right. My point, though, is there is no uh, analysis built in of your personal risk factors, mm -hmm. your family history, your mm -hmm. lifestyle, 
nor how you should really use the information that they're giving you about your uh, genetic profile mm -hmm. in altering your uh, health span. Mm -hmm. And so even though it's a report that kind of stands alone or the company would like it to stand alone, mm -hmm. I personally believe it's important to have guidance from your physician mm -hmm. or by someone who's familiar with both the test results and what they mean and you as an individual. Okay, so we can either do the test without interpretation or the test with interpretation. Without a consultation by me or, or another doctor. Right, okay, so that's level one. Yes. So the second company is uh, Interleukin Genetics. It is the uh, test I mentioned for weight management, mm. also for nutritional needs. Mm -hmm. And they have two others that are specifically related to the inflammatory gene mutations that, that I alluded to, mm. heart health and bone health. Mm. So there's four things within that test. Right. Again, this is a swab of the inside of your cheek, uh -huh. also fast and easy and painless. Uh, and so the four tests uh, you can do all at once uh -huh. or you can pick and choose based on again your personal uh, concerns and family history. If there's a strong history of osteoporosis in, in your family mm -hmm. the bone health one would make some sense. Similarly mm -hmm. uh, heart risk and they're looking at mutations in, in these interleukin genes that are different from the ones that are covered by 23andMe so they're complementary. Ah. So if you do this grouping of tests, the level one testing, mm -hmm. it's not like it's going to be a big overlap with the level two testing. It's a completely different set of exactly. things that they're checking for. Right. Okay, so we got level one that's straightforward, yes. with or without the interpretation. We've right. got level two that has four different parts, and you could do one, one of them one or, or four of them, <laughs> and you can do that with the interpretation. Right. And then there's the telomeres. Is that right? Correct. Is that so the, the third level that we're talking right. about now? And so the, the telomere testing um, that we're offering uh, comes either by blood or by saliva um, and that's just a you know, one-off test mm -hmm. except that it is the only one of the group mm -hmm. that really makes sense to repeat on a periodic basis. Mm -hmm. The others, once we know you have this particular variant in your genome, it doesn't change. You're done. But yep. telomeres, mm -hmm. by virtue of that epigenetic interaction with your environment, mm -hmm. the way you behave, the way you think, mm -hmm. will actually make them longer or shorter over time. And what we now know is it's not just the absolute where you're, where you're sitting in relation to the average in the population. It's what's happening over time that's important for predicting your future health. Mm -hmm. If your telomeres are shorter than they should be, and they're shortening rapidly, mm -hmm. um, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And that requires a very aggressive intervention, which we know will help change that slope and, and build up your telomeres. Okay. And so it's a, you know, every one and a half to two years, I'd suggest that there's a repeat of that test. Mm -hmm. Great, okay. So we've got level one is simple. Level two has the four different tests, mm -hmm. and level three is to have the telomere uh, Telomere. Telomere testing is yes. what it's called, which, you know, I think is critical. That's, that's your scorecard. Bingo. Your biological age. All the rest is fluff. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that for those who are very keen on the full genomics panel, uh, we package that in a way that would lead to the most uh, utility over time for, right. for your health. In fact, level one and two are really things that you can do to alter the telomeres. Yes. And your ultimate health and vitality for the future. Exactly. Perfect. Sounds like a plan. So I'm excited because Dr. Cook is going to be joining us at Martin's Rejuvenation Center. He's also got his P3 clinic, which goes into even more profound detail and consultation in, at his private clinic in Toronto. And in Sounds that great. clinic, the idea is that we take this information, we develop an action plan around better health, and then we help you implement it with the tools in a toolbox, mm -hmm. as mentioned fitness training in the gym, mm -hmm. uh, teaching kitchen and nutritional support, mm -hmm. and perhaps most importantly what you might find difficult to achieve anywhere else is training and meditation and mindfulness practice and other contemplative practices like yoga. Sounds great. I love it. Me too. I'm excited. <laughs> Let's do that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, join us because I think this is valuable for everyone.